All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today um, for this, this month's um, PM roundtable session. Um, so as you know, we're going to be talking about co reviewing contracts. Um, and Steve has joined us here today. I connected with him through uh, someone I work with at SOM, and he uh, kind of... Uh, introduced me to, or, or mentioned Steve to me as kind of like the uh, the leader of the project managers at SMMA, is kind of what he said. And um, so we connected actually before another PM roundtable session, and he had mentioned that he reviews all the contracts that come through SMMA. So all the PMs kind of take a pass, first pass, and then he sees them all before they um, officially get executed. And I remember thinking like, ooh, hmm, he's, he's probably someone I should, I should learn some things yeah. from because... <laughs> I know every time I sit down to review them, which hasn't been a lot, but um, I'm like, oh, gee, what exactly am I looking for here? <laughs> um, you know, I kind of feel like I, I uh, got enough knowledge in my head to pass my exams, shelved that information for a few years. Um, and then now as a PM, I'm like, oh, OK, I need to I need to understand how all this works more. And what am I really looking for? And what's important and why? Um so I think Steve's put together a really great presentation today. Um, and, you know, he's an architect, not a lawyer. So actually, right. you know, I think helpful from, from our perspective, yeah. though, because you're looking sure. at it as another project manager, not as a lawyer and, you know, years of experience and probably having reviewed hundreds of contracts, right? Um, yeah. So I think he has a really great presentation kind of walking us through the basics all the way into some of the kind of specifics of things to look for. Um, so he'll talk for about, I think he's got about half an hour and feel free to jump in with questions. If there are a lot of questions, we might ask, start asking people to kind of hold them to the end, but we'll have a chunk of time at the end too, to answer people's specific or general questions uh, if you have anything at the end. So with that, Steve, I think I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Rosalind. And um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you everyone for allowing me to join and um, maybe... Uh, unlike Rosalind says, there, there's maybe a combination of experience, but also just kind of research and, you know, asking people about contracts, which I think is is equally important. I'll start the, the presentation. Hold on one sec. Uh, okay. Can you see that? Okay. Does everything look good? Okay, great. Um, so, um, yeah, first and first and foremost, I would say uh, think about your your sources of information. And uh, for me, one of the best is our insurance agent. Um, it's not Jake, but uh, you know, you all have a maybe a different insurance agent, and uh, they are a great resource for this information. They want you to be protected. Uh, they they don't you know welcome claims at all. They want you to be uh, avoiding claims as much as possible. And the same with your insurance underwriter. Uh, both of those are excellent sources. Um, our insurance underwriter, who is Berkeley Design Professional, they also have a whole uh, webinar and learning program, which is great. Um, you can do it at your own pace. They've come into our office to present as well. Um, the AIA.org is also a great resource. I'll touch on that a little bit. Talking with colleagues as we are now, maybe you, your firm as an attorney, you can reach out to, I reach out to ours maybe, I don't know, it's not that often, once a year if something's a little funny or sticky uh, and just general research, I think you can find just about anything. So, and also, you know, happy to take questions today to the best of my ability and, uh, you know, offline as well, so. Uh, we'll jump into it. So the agenda, uh, I'm going to kind of quickly go through just basic contract stuff. Some of you may know this, some of the stuff may be foreign. I'm not sure, you know, the kind of the experience of the audience. So I'll do that part a little quicker. And then when we get into like larger issues like standard of care or indemnification, take a little longer with those subjects. Uh, and I've, I've, uh, I've added some pictures for you all. I know your architects, you're more visual. Uh, and also you're eating lunch, so I don't want you to get too bored and uh, fall asleep. So with that, um, jumping into this, I think the biggest thing for me is thinking about uh, your relationship with your client, with your owner. 
and not being uh, as much as possible, not being intimidated by uh, maybe they're a big company. Uh, you think they hold all the cards. I'm um, showing a picture of the Godfather, but you know there could be situations where they don't budge on something, and it's most important to kind of know your risk and know where you're standing with them. And there could be situations where you just can't take the job. So that could be the other thing too. But uh, the one thing I'm trying to drive here is just not being fearful of the situation, but you know, with with good information, with good knowledge, you can be really confident in going into this. And that's important because, you know, your your firm is relying on you to make these good decisions and and be informed about you know what your what your risks are um you know i'm trying to emphasize here when working with a client or when working with their legal team you want this to be fair and uh you know you're operating from a position of of uh you know professional liability here you want to be comfortable in your position so it's it's best that everyone be in a good situation and kind of like a big movie set or maybe a football team there's so many people involved you know the projects we do and again you know the owner has to be comfortable that they're covered you want to be comfortable that you're covered um it's really important to identify uh not only your needs but you might be educating the owner on actually what they need sometimes i've been in many situations where there's lawyers who you know, they're very good at, say, arguing and, uh, you know, negotiating on lease terms. And that's obviously something where everyone's trying to gain something. Um, honestly, with in terms of the, the terms and conditions of a contract, it's not something you really want to, um, in many cases, negotiate on. There's some, there's some issues that are just non-negotiable. But when it comes to, say, your fee or the schedule, yeah, you could give a little, you know, take a little, what have you, but there are certain, certain things that are non-negotiable that I'll try to identify today. Um, so just basically, you know, the need for a contract, uh, just that there's a, a mutual understanding and also memorializing the understanding. Say you're, you've met with a new, you know, there's a restaurant owner in town. They're thinking about a new restaurant. You have a meeting. It all sounds great, but it's, it's capturing, you know, that scope of work, which is so important. And, you know, what, what the rules are. And that's the great thing about this. You can establish your own rules. And through that process, you can also understand your client a little bit better, understand their needs. And they're relying on you for allocating risk. And that's why in turn, you have your professional li liability insurance because they see you as the professional architect, professional engineer. So um, elements of contracts. Here's a, here's a guy who got a great contract. He's very happy. So the basics of a contract is that there's an offer by one party and approval by the other. And binding that is consideration. It could be money, it could be uh, equity in a company, et cetera. Uh, the most important thing is that the agreement is enforceable. Uh, and that is to say there are no illegal sections in the contract. Uh, if there are illegal sections, what you wanna have is, and there's a severability provision, which is to say, if there is an illegal section that can be car carved out and the rest of the contract is still intact. Um, obviously there has to, there has to be uh, competent parties. So that is to say, he's a professional soccer player. I am a professional architect, uh, professional engineer, et cetera. So you have to have uh, competent parties and of course precedence with the law that's always comes into play, which is very important. Um, just quickly, different types of contracts with, say, a simple letter proposal, what we do at our firm anyway, it's just kind of out, 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 outline the, the project understanding, the scope of services, what we're going to do, and, you know, not just the different disciplines, but also here's what we're doing in schematic design, here's what we do in CA, et cetera. You want to identify any assumptions or clarifications, such as, um, well, we're going to locate, you know, card reader back boxes and conduit on our plans, but we're not designing the security system, uh, you know, items like that. Or you might say, you know, this contract is based on uh, an assumption that's a 40, you haven't given us a budget, we assume it's $40 million. Things like that, you're identifying the schedule, your compensation, it's usually one of two flavors, it's fixed fee or it's time and materials. 
And lastly, attaching your terms and conditions, which is very important. And for our letter proposals, it's kind of a short, you know, two page um, terms and conditions. Uh, when you get into AIA agreements, uh, the kind of the gold standard is the B101. It's the very formal, traditional agreement. There are other agreements, say like a B105, which is kind of a shorter version if it's a small project, maybe, uh, or if you already have a contractor on board and they're doing pre-construction services. That is to say, they are establishing the cost of the work. It's um, maybe better to use a different agreement like the B133 or B134, and there are also if you go on the AIA um, website, there are some great relationship diagrams. I'm clicking on one now. And it kind of sets up for you. Let's say, you know, if, if the contractor is going to use a uh, a typical A101 with a 201, you, you could use these agreements. And it kind of goes through their small projects, just interiors. Um, I think here's what I was, that's a different one. This is the the other one I was talking about where you have somebody doing pre-construction, which is great. So that's one option. And then um, for good documents, and then they have another section here, which is just, oops, just all the, I think it's coming up, all the nitty gritty. So the A series for contractors, B series between owners and architects. C is say like the C401 is between our architect and their their consultant, maybe I have an acoustical consultant, uh, et cetera. So very, very good resources there. Um, okay, moving on. And again, jump in with any questions. Uh, then you can get some interesting agreements, which are just owner-generated agreements. We work for the MSBA. We work for NAVFAC. You know, they all have their own agreements. This is an agreement that I'm showing that I have with a, a large developer in the Boston area, and they again, it's kind of home, homemade, uh, and so you have to be very careful when you review these. You want to make sure you have the kind of same protections that you'd get with your your B one hundred and one, um, and you're not missing anything. So that's very important to kind of go through. Uh, when you work with your consultants, um, I just typically do what we do is a kind of a one page document saying, you know, here's what we agree to. It's really the the exhibits which matter, which is the consultant scope of work. I've created our own terms and conditions for working with a consultant based upon the C401. It's just a much shorter version. It's simpler to read for everyone. And then you want to attach the prime agreement. That's the most critical thing is the idea is that the, the terms and conditions and the prime agreement you have with your owner flow down. You'll hear that term a lot, flow down to the consultant. And it could be, you know, every little detail, but also say insurance requirements um, for them, the schedule, what have you. I actually so, have a question, Steve. Yeah. Um, I thought of this when we were talking the other day or today would be a good day to bring it up. So when you like respond or when you give the consultants your terms and conditions, do you ever yeah. get pushback from them? Like, hey, we have our standard terms and conditions we'd really rather use or do people, yeah. are, are, are consultants usually kind of accepting of, sure, like we'll agree to. And, and we've we've done that many times too. We've I say I guess there's a couple of issues. We've in, we've agreed to consultants' terms many times. So we'll you know redline those. Um, it's better to use yours, especially when you have an agreement with the owner, and again have that that flow down. Yeah. But they could be like, hey, I'm just doing hardware specs for you guys. It's three thousand dollars. You know, give me a break. And you're making a business decision there. Like you know, this isn't so much of a risk. They're not a major. You know, they're not my MEP engineer. I think I could, I could maybe let that go. That's for you to decide. So, all right. So, just to jump into the issues. Um, so, one of the biggest is the the standard of care, and there's a couple of different issues to mention here, which is that this the, the standard of care is is in essence. What is expected of you as a professional architect? What would a, an architect do in the Boston area on a hospital project? What what would the typical architect do? Um, you know, in a in a neonatal intensive care unit, what would be expected? That's kind of the basis. And they, you know, in a courtroom with an expert witness, uh, you know, who has, you know, obviously, you know, the, the um, 
the ability to 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 be to be an extra witness, uh, they would say, well, here's what is expected of that architect. Or, you know, on a typical job, you know, would you expect drains on a flat roof? Yes. And so you're held to that. So that establishes the standard of care. In the absence of a contract with your client, there is a there's essentially a default standard of care that's expected of you if you were to go to, to court like this. So that's that's just kind of baseline. If you have an agreement, you have to be very careful not to what is called elevate the standard of care. And your insurance agent will, will talk to you about this. You don't want to elevate the standard of care by saying that you are the high. I have a picture of Frank Lloyd right here that you're saying you're the highest. You'll provide the highest standard of care or that you're a premier architectural firm. It doesn't matter how great you are. Um, in your marketing materials on the street, you can talk about how great you are and you're the best uh, lab designer in the Boston area. That's fine. When it comes to your contract, you do not want to elevate the standard of care because it will in invalidate your professional liability insurance. It becomes this, the easiest target in a, in a courtroom because if you think about it, it is essentially impossible to be the highest. You know, if you make one mistake, the argument would be, well, if you're the highest, how could you have possibly made this mistake by putting the air barrier in this location? You know, if you're the highest. So if the, if you're, and I've put an example down here, but it just, it simply, it simply says what I described. It's just, you know, what an ordinary architect would do as in an ordinary situation in this, usually in this environment, uh, consistent with the professional skill and care and progress of the project. So you don't want to any promise any more than that. So uh, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, in a similar manner, you might find in your contracts the word warranty, the, ar the architect warrants or guarantees or certifies, and even you ensure you know, you ensure, assure something. Uh, essentially what that means is that something is 100% perfect. Uh, and has anyone out there designed 100% perfect drawings? Uh, <laughs> no, we never do. And things happen and our insurance companies know that. So it's not about, this isn't about serving the customer. It's about aligning with your insurance. Your insurance company knows that you're not going to make perfect drawings. You're not going to make a perfect product like the Apple iPhone 15 and things are going to happen. So they do not want you to say that you're going to warrant anything. You do not guarantee anything. And some examples might be that, you know, if you claim that the building was constructed in accordance with the plans and specifications, well, you know, how do you know every little piece of rebar is exactly in the right place or you know what they did on the roof it's just impossible to 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 guarantee that or that the site's free of hazardous materials did they check every single square inch how deep did they go or saying lead gold will be achieved that seems very difficult too that's kind of out of your out of your control right that's you rely on the contractor you rely on usgbc so very difficult as well so you want to avoid stating warranty or guarantee um, just, uh, just to say too, just simply, this is one of the easiest things to prove, you know, in a claim that you're not hundred percent perfect. We typically say, and this is an example of our, uh, initial construction control document. You know, when we submit plans for a permit, we just say to the best of my knowledge, information, and belief, we don't say certify. We don't include that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Okay. So getting on to another thing, which is the next big thing is indemnification. Um, indemnification is the owner asking you, hey, you're the professional. If something goes wrong, if you don't include a doorway that's wide enough, you didn't include a second means of egress, you didn't include the right 
you know, air barrier or something like that. You're the professional. Uh, if you make a mistake, I want to be reimbursed for that mistake. You should be able to reimburse me. And that's why we have insurance because we do make some mistakes, right? So it's, but it, but the important thing is that it's not, and I'm showing the banana peel, heel, banana peel uh, image here. That is, that's a slope and fall. That's covered by your commercial general liability insurance or anything to do with a car is covered by your, your auto insurance. And I know you all have that, that as well. There's also workers comp. Professional liability insurance covers your negligence. And that's the most important thing is your negligence. Negligence in the performance of professional services. And if you are negligent, you'll reimburse the owner, okay? The most important thing is that the owner, although they don't sometimes know this and they're constantly kind of going after things when you're negotiating and trying to have it their way, they want you to be covered. They desperately want you to be covered. They don't, may, they may not even know it, but if you don't have coverage, they're going to sue you and they're going to get what? I'm showing it in the lower left, lower, lower right corner. They're going to get some computers, a couple of old chairs. Like when they, when they sue you and you're bankrupt, they're not getting that much. They want the money and you want to be able to prove to them that you have the money by way of your professional insurance. That is the most important argument that you can make is that you are covered. Because when they talk about their legal, their lawyer, their lawyers really like could be 20 lawyers, <laughs> right? It could be a very big expensive team. Um, so uh, that's that's one thing here where we, we say, I don't know if you can see a cursor here, but I say, including reasonable attorney, attorney's fees. That's always something you want to include. Another thing that's very important, which you're seeing at the bottom of this, uh, the second to last line, it talks about comparative fault of the consultant. That is to say, if you don't include that, um, if you make one little mistake or you're just barely tangentially involved with something, you know, only to 1%, let's say, they could put the entire fault of this on you and you could be on the hook for way more than you expect. What's also important about that is that in our professional liability insurance um, uh, coverage um, and probably yours as well, it, it, mentioned this, it mentions this issue specifically and that you're only liable for a comparative fault. So, your insurance may not cover you if you've obligated yourself to more than your proportional share, okay? So I think that's something you really need to argue for as well. Um, one other element of this, and you can see all kinds of examples of, of uh, you know, what the best, um, you know, indemnity, indemnity provision is, but, uh, you know, these basic things, the proportional fault, reasonable attorney's fees. Another one that I typically like to do is limiting this all to the extent they are caused by, caused by the negligent acts or omissions of the consultant in the performance of professional services. That is the key that you're tying this to the negligent acts in the performance of professional services. And that directly relates to your insurance. Um, so uh, now our insurance agent said that sometimes you'll see alleged, uh, alleged to have caused. Um, he thought that was, and maybe it was the particular situ situation I was looking at, but he thought alleged was okay because Maybe it's it's always alleged until it's proven. The point being is that there's no indemnification happening until it's proven. That's why I like caused by. Caused by means you are it's been adjudicated, you're found to be negligent. It's you know, it's decided. So that's maybe an important one to keep in mind too. Also important in here is typically what you get from an owner. It'll say at the very top, the consultant shall indemnify, defend, and hold the client, blah, 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 harmless. So the word defend is a big problem. The word defend 
uh, means you will take action and uh, you will provide, you know, reimbursement for the costs of their attorneys. Well, your professional liability insurance does not cover defense. There is no defense obligation in your professional liability insurance. So you have, you have to strike that word defend. Um, again, especially if it's something like, you know, an alleged, uh, you know, they say, Steve, you're a terrible project manager. We're, we're filing a claim of a hundred, you know, a million dollars and you're going to court and I'm paying their lawyers, you know, to prove that I'm a terrible project manager. Well, no, I don't want to pay for that until you've proven that. So that's a very important one as well. Um, lastly, or there's two things really. Uh, another one is simply that sometimes you'll see a sentence after this indemnification clause that says uh, the, the the limitation of there is there's there is no limitation on the liability uh, between the owner and the consultant. And then you're thinking like. Do they really mean that? Yes, they really mean that. They don't want it to be limited just to your 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 insurance. Um, again, you could go bankrupt on this. So you want to limit this to the proceeds of your insurance coverage. You might have, and everybody's different, but you might have, say, you know, um, $5 million per occurrence and $10 million in the aggregate. Everyone might be a little bit different. That's what ours is, but you should you should check that. And again, it should be, you know, in terms of what your insurance can cover, uh, there's no great rules for this, but I tend to think like in a kind of a, um, a rule around, there's an understanding that an architect might make mistakes that are worth anywhere from three to 5% on the total construction cost. 5% actually sounds like a lot. But anyway, even if you like double, triple that to 10%, you know, if I if I have five million dollars per claim, that's fifty million dollars and a hundred million in the aggregate. So that covers a lot. Um, again, that's just my rule of thumb. I'm not sure you're going to find a lot written about that. You might ask your insurance agent how they feel about it. But um, and, and and the opposite of that too. Those those are like our our higher end limits. You can negotiate aside from what it says in your certificate of insurance. You, you can negotiate. Uh, lower limits. So say I'm doing a job that the construction cost is only total of $2 million. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow, you know, I'm not going to say that I'm liable for $5 million. Why would I take that as extra risk? I'll limit it down to at the lowest, you know, my fee, or I might limit it to a million dollars. And again, this is just something you get comfortable with over time. Um, the last thing with regard to the indemnification clause is that sometimes they'll the owner might really hold firm on indemnify and defend and all this stuff, and they're thinking about anything that can happen, like that banana peel. Um, that's fine. Just let them have it. Your CGL will cover that. You should insert a second paragraph or sentence, what have you, that talks about the you know your, you know, with regard to negligence of your, in the performance of your professional services, you know, you're limited, everything we just talked about, you know, proportional law responsibility, limited to the uh, proceeds of coverage, not defend, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes that's easier instead of wordsmithing a particular paragraph is just to add a direct statement about what you're covering regarding your professional services. Uh, I think, I don't know if there was one question. I don't know. I yeah, something. there was. Um, Liz asked if you would be sharing a PDF of the slides afterwards. I don't, we not, haven't actually talked about that ahead of time, but I don't know if that's something you'd be. You know what? I uh, This is going to sound ironic. I thought about that. I thought someone would ask about that. I will share a, a, I will share the slides. I might take off the photos because I think some of these photos I just stole from the internet. And oh, sure. They might have... <laughs> copyrights attached or something like that so <laughs> speaking of yeah, legal so, uh, implications of uh... <laughs> exactly so i don't want to i'll just uh clean it up which is fine. Sure. okay um dispute resolution this is this is pretty simple um 
this you want to have a stepped approach you always want to like list out a stepped approach just first simple negotiation you sit down with your client you're going to talk it through if that fails you go to mediation and a mediation in the top the top image there's a single mediator what they typically do is you know the two parties will come to a, a kind of a, a neutral venue the mediator will listen and talk to one party they'll go into another room talk to the other party they'll maybe go back and forth a little bit look at the two parties together and that mediator will try to hammer out you know a negotiated basically settlement uh around the issue uh and this is you know usually something that's much cheaper than going into to litigation um the last if mediation fails and mediation is not binding if mediation fails you want to go to the litigation that is in a courtroom um and i'll talk about why you want to go to lit litigation in the next slide uh but with respect to mediation um or even litigation, you want to have a clause about prevailing party fees. And sometimes what these these clauses will say is that the prevailing party is going to prevent, you know, the the party that doesn't prevail essentially has to pay the prevailing party all its fees and costs. Well, you know, you know, what if what if you know there's kind of a, a partial thing here, like the owner kind of decided to make a change. You know, you are you argued against it. They made the change anyway to the roof, uh, and it's not 100% clear that it was your fault. You know, you want to have some language in here that just says, you know, the prevailing. It's due at the bottom, the bottom uh, bullet. You know, it's just you want to have it related to percentage. Okay, uh, your percentage of li liability. Um, Again, the other thing I think I've mentioned this before is in terms of percentage, again, a contractual liability exclusion in your in your policy. So it it doesn't really you don't want it to have it to be all or nothing. That's that's not good. And especially too, because there's kind of a I said it here too, there's a disparity of obligations. The owner, you know, you're the one really on the hook on this whole thing. You're the professional, you're the one who's really at risk here. They don't know how to design a, you know, a steel structure. So um it's really all on you uh let's go to the next slide okay so this comes up a lot is sometimes you'll look at a contract and it'll it'll say arbitration um <clears throat> every single legal talk that i've <clears throat> pardon me every single legal talk that i've been to they always you know tell you not to to agree to arbitration um the arbitrators don't have to follow basic legal processes. Uh, the discovery can be limited. They can't subpoena. They don't have to require sworn testimony. Uh, the arbitrators themselves, they don't act the way a judge acts. They can refuse to accept certain evidence. They can accept others. Um, they allow, they could allow hearsay testimony. Um, they may not completely understand our industry. It's definitely more expensive than litigation and it's binding. No, sorry. <clears throat> it's not any cheaper than litigation. It's definitely more expensive than mediation. Um, the decision is binding and very difficult to overturn. And there's only one maybe what that I've read, one small advantage, which might be if it's a very small claim, it might be okay. But I think you just want to steer clear of it because mediation is way less expensive, much faster. It's not binding if somehow in the end, if you don't feel it's right, you could always go to litigation again. Uh, it's private. Um, discovery is a much simpler process. Um, uh, you share the cost of the mediator and the venue. And it's gen generally understood to be a much simpler, easier process. And you know, I, I think I said it somewhere, but basically, you know, once you get into arbitration and litigation, it's very serious and your, your, you know, reputations are at stake and, uh, you know, you're, you're really ruining relationships, you know, at that point, most likely. Uh, any other questions? I see some more pop-ups. No. Okay, good. Um, touch on ownership of documents. So forever and ever, it seemed like this was never a thing. And then more and more owners have looked to 
retain the ownership of documents in the in the B101. It still says, you know, the the argument the architect owns rights the, to their instruments of service, which are our documents. But um, more and more, the owners are looking for ownership of those documents to use them however they like. They paid for them. You know, it's it's a reasonable understanding. So the best option is to uh, allow them maybe limited use of the documents, that you still own the documents, but they can use them. Okay, they might agree to that. If they don't agree to that, you know, what you wanna do is, is cover yourself. And there's really kind of two things here. The first thing is that, and I'm showing this hotel image, you know, maybe there's kind of a, a branding that happens here at the Crown Hotel and you design this beautiful reception desk and it was kind of a one-off thing, but then they decide, hey, we're gonna use this desk at every one of our 200 Crown Hotels around the world and they're getting designed for free. And then they're gonna use it all, all, their, <laughs> all their other hotels too. They like it so much. Uh, and you've done all this design for free. That's this kind of premise of keeping copyright on something. If you can keep copyright on something, it's, it's very helpful. Um, again, if they're still looking for ownership, Number one, it's got to be dependent upon payment. Like they've got to pay you for something they want to take ownership of up until the date you're done with the project or let go. Um, you want to say you don't take any responsibility for the manip manipulation of their documents or reuse of the documents. You know, if you think about it, uh, if they reuse the documents, let's say uh, there's a Crown Hotel in Boston, that's very different from a Crown Hotel in Arizona and the details you might do around insulation and air barriers. They are not the same thing, not the same environment. It's inappropriate. Uh, in the same manner, if you, you know, if they expect to use the same details and patch something 20 years from now or rebuild something 20 years from now, the technology may be outdated. There may be better solutions. Um, so you don't want to be held liable for that or anybody that they send their do the documents that you created to. Um, and at a minimum, you want to kind of at the bottom bullet carve out, you know, you're allowed to reuse your standard details, specifications, et cetera. You've created those over time. Um, okay. Uh, another one I kind of, happen upon every now and again is the cost of the work. And again, most often jobs I'm on anyway, the cost of the work is established either by like on our school projects, by a, a third party, sometimes two third two uh, different cost consultants. Uh, in kind of uh, commercial work, we might hire an estimator now and then, you know, most often, it's really the uh, the owner hiring for pre-construction services, the construction manager who determines the cost of the work. So watch out for the language in the BO 101. I don't like it where it says, what I've highlighted here, it's prepared by the architect. It's depending on how you read it. I make it very clear in here when I'm not doing the cost of the work that we're limited just evaluation evaluations of the cost of the work prepared by others prepared by others. And we'll do that all day long. And we'll kind of look over, you know, whatever the construction manager does and give our opinion. Um, let's see, the other thing to say is just simply, I don't advise that architects do, you know, estimates of cost of work. This is extremely difficult work for contractors. They're scratching their heads right now uh, on what things cost. Um, with inflation, et cetera, they cannot figure it out. So the chances of you doing that are very slim. Uh, getting toward the end here. So simply uh, waivers, waivers of consequential damages, you wanna have those in place. Uh, you know, let's say you're doing a casino job and if they don't open on August 1st, you owe them all this money. Well, that's, you know, some of these things are just beyond your control, namely the contractor. You don't control that. It's, you know, the damages are very excessive, difficult to even calculate. And again, factors out, outside of your control. So you want to have that in place. The waiver of, waiver of subrogation is something that usually a client asks for. It's that simply that uh, 
the insured uh, normally, if you had subrogation, the the owners insurer they could step into the shoes of the insured your owner and they could counter sue you for for damages so you want to be um and it's just like lawsuits from my understanding of this it's just like lawsuits back and forth and it's kind of a mess so again the waiver of subrogation is usually usually fine uh i would check with your insurance company to make sure it's okay but i think they're they're generally fine with it this is pretty common Uh, just lastly, a few uh, miscellaneous things. Again, I actually mentioned this earlier, the limitation of liability, if it's a small project, limiting that to your fee or something, you know, appropriate for your uh, less than your less than your limits and reducing your risk. Um, you know, this is something we've all probably do. Just the scope of work on a project, very important to clarify what it is you're doing and not doing. It's always helpful. Uh, this is sometimes popping up in contracts when you see the word safety. You, as the architect, are not responsible for safety. You're not responsible for safety on the job site. You're not responsible for means and methods, safety protocols. That's the contractor. In addition, you're not responsible for safety once the job is built. It's not my fault that, you know, somebody walking down the stairs is looking at their phone and they step on a little puddle of water and they slip and fall, we designed to code. We designed the stairs to code. That guy was being an idiot and tripped and fell. So I don't want to be responsible for safety at all. Um, lastly, just, you know, the owner has some responsibilities too with informing you, you know, maybe history of the job site. Maybe there was, a, you know, some toxic materials on the job site a long time ago, what they know about the job. So any any documents they have on the job. Um, and I think I'm getting to the end. Oh, so in the summary, so the summary is simply, for me, the kind of high level is, you know, being informed and not having any fear in negotiations. You got to, you know, just go in confident and not a false confidence, but understanding what your your limitations are. If you get into a situation where, it just doesn't look good. You're going to have to make a business decision whether this is right for you or not. Uh, I would say, too, avoiding perfection. That's It's just nearly impossible with negotiation. Um, you're going to have to learn to live with some of these things, but kind of prioritize those things that are most important where you're really, you know, there's a lot of money at stake with your firm being sued um, and try to try to do that. So. I'll wrap up there and um, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Yeah, does anyone want to jump in with any questions? Diana, I see you have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course I do. Ross and Ross and work <laughs> together and it's kind of in Steve's role at some. In terms of being the legal quote unquote expert as an architect, right? Um, I'm wondering, Steve, if you have any tips. We work with a lot of public agencies that hand us a contract and say, by giving us a proposal for this project, you accept this contract as is, and we don't. We get a lot of kind of lousy terms that way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any, and we any we get those. Do we work there? Uh, I don't know if there is, Diana. I, I think it's. I think I'm in the same in the same boat. And we saw a we saw a contract. I think it was from Massport, and it was like, well, we're going to decide to do this thing or we're not. And it was not perfect at all. And there's some language in there I didn't like. And then, you know, maybe what you do is you research, you know, how often does Massport sue architects? Maybe it's not that often. Uh, you know, it depends, too, on your your comfort level with a client. You know, Massport is a little new for us. So it was like feeling I'm feeling pretty uneasy about that, to be honest with you. Whereas some clients we have, we've worked for 25, 30 years, honestly. Um, so we we kind of know what to expect if something isn't perfect in a contract. Um, and yeah, we get a lot of those. There's, we did some work for, uh, you know, another example might be, we, it was a college, I think it was Rhode Island College, and it's tied to the state. The state creates the the architect agreement. Right. And it was kind of, uh, again, I went right up to the state though. I called somebody in their procurement office and the short of it was, 
it looked like it was going to be a long trail ride to get this one word taken out. We kind of had to decide if this was right for us. So again, a kind of business decision, business decision for us. And, you know, sometimes you, you take some chances and sometimes you, it's too much for you. And, you know, I hear different stories about different firms that we've, you know, been collaborating with and they don't take any chances. And, so it's really up to each firm, but it's important to kind of talk those things through and, and what's right for you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I know I have a couple, maybe I'll jump in if no one's raising their hand. So Steve, I had a question thinking about the, you mentioned um, having a contract with the CM. Oh, sorry. Well, I see Mary, you've raised your hand. Let me, fin I'll finish my question, I guess. Then we'll, we'll... <laughs> And jump over to you. Um, yeah, having a contract with the CM and you mentioned that having to do with the fact that they're establishing costs of the work. And I don't know, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I feel like that's something I haven't thought about before. Sure. Yeah, it's just it's just it's just simple language that's in in the B101. And even if it's not in the B101, you know, maybe in your in a letter proposal, you say uh maybe a couple of things that you haven't given us a budget for the you haven't given us a budget for the project. Uh, we do not prepare cost estimates. Uh, we assume that is by others. Maybe it's by your, you could say by your, maybe there's a contractor on board. You could say maybe it's by Lee Kennedy or it's by your contractor. I think you want to just state clearly that you do not do that. Or they might say, no, 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 no. We need you to do it. We need you to estimate this. And you say, okay, fine. Uh, we're going to have to take on an estimator and you know, it's going to be about, $7,500 or whatever the, the number is. You just have to lay it out clearly, but, um, you know, things can go kind of sideways if, if you think you know what things cost. So. Yeah. Mary, I know you had a question. Uh, hi. Um, I, actually I was, um, clapping and thank you oh, <laughs> for a, really an excellent, um, presentation. And uh, I'm a, a condominium trustee. And uh, it was very, very helpful. I'm very grateful and will uh, appreciate it if I can get the text of the slides. It just sure. makes contracts a little more approachable. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. And uh, again, for those doing residential work, we don't do a lot at SMMA. We don't do a lot of residential work. We have in the past um, but talk to your agent about that too, because they they mean to put you in a different kind of coverage for that. Specifically with residential uh, apartment buildings, that's kind of one thing, and there's definitely some risk there. Uh, but when it comes to actually condo buildings, and we've done some, when it comes to condo buildings, there is elevated risk because you might have 200 condo owners in a in a building, and they all have rights. Um, and they could come come after you for different things. Um, and so I think I think our agent said that you know if if over five percent of your work is condominiums, we're going to need a different kind of policy. Uh, we're we're under that. But just for the architects out there to make sure you're aware of that. Interesting. Um, I had another question. It's kind of a very specific one, but um, what about consultants, for example, I think of hardware. Sometimes we're working with hardware consultants um, yeah. and they're not necessarily like a paid consultant. It's kind of one of those, like they're helping us put together the great, hardware sets. Yeah. Would you do a contract with them? <laughs> right. Like that's a, that's a great question. That is a really good question. You know, what would you do? I think the important thing to do, you know, what you should be doing is that, you know, whether you like it or not, you're making an agreement, right? There's some kind of an agreement. Well, and we talked about, we talked about consideration. There's no consideration there. So, you know, do you really have an agreement? I think that if you intend for that consultant to be somewhat responsible, even for, you know, questions during CA or a question after the, after the job is built, like something goes wrong, like, you know, you are relying on that consultant. So it, even if you have it, honestly, in email, you know, it's not the best, but even if you have it in email, like, 
you're okay not getting paid, right? Or whatever. Like, yeah, I think you want to identify that uh, and just clarify where you stand with people. Yeah. So that that kind of that's kind of a lead on uh, subject actually to another thing, which is you know, do you have contracts for every single project? Well, your insurance agent and insurance underwriter will tell you they do not like verbal agreements at all <laughs> because verbal agreements you know you go to you go to court and anything goes right it's just he he said she said uh it, there's there's nothing really tying you together um i have heard that in the in the in the absence of a contract you can say maybe you've sent maybe you've sent a proposal and the, and the owner just isn't signing it you could just send in an email like Hey, uh, you know, we're proceeding. Uh, we're going to be billing you this much. Uh, just going ahead. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Like you're just kind of checking in and even email correspondence can help a little bit just to kind of lock things down. I think I did read in a, uh, uh it was a, a week ago in a, a guideline that I have that in the absence of an agreement, you know, if you can show that through correspondence that, you know, you were, you were doing the work, they agreed to the work, they're paying for the work, that, you know, there was some kind of a, an arrangement there that could be, you know, argued in your favor. So not yeah. the best situation. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So we have about five minutes left. Does anyone else have any other questions? last thing I was kind of curious about and open this up to everyone or see if you have any um I don't know kind of like anecdotally things to share sometimes I think especially for more junior people who don't have the experience and like um context for like how these things come up and why they're so important like anyone who's been through litigation or mediation like a specific situation where how this came up or why the contract became really the terms of the contract became important or sometimes I think that's helpful for some of us so Steve I don't know if you have any examples or even anyone else on the call if they have experience they want to share I don't see anyone jumping in that's, maybe, that's good, maybe that's good news nobody oh, nobody I know right? nobody getting in trouble yeah true yeah. Mary I see you, you have your hand up I do. I do have a question about mediation. Um, who, whom do you approach for mediation in your uh, practice or industry? Sure. sure. I We don't get into it too often, so I can't say I actually even have that experience, thankfully. But, uh, you know, if, if there is an attorney that you typically deal with, they might be able to recommend mediators. I'm sure there's a way to kind of you know, find mediators somehow, or maybe again, here we are with the BSA, the BSA might have a good, you know, good references. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. But, um, and certainly, you know, anyone's welcome to shoot me an email, call me, et cetera. I'm happy to do my best, but certainly, you know, back to my kind of first slide, you know, talking to your insurance agent, your insurance underwriter, they're very, very happy to help you. They want to make sure you're covered. Um, great. Well, thank you. This has been a, a great, great presentation. Great discussion.